So today is uh, Monday, February 15th, 3.30 section. Uh, we're gonna spend most of our time today talking through homework three, which is the solution for Stanley Black and Decker as uh, EIC. But before we get there, uh, just as a reminder that on Wednesday, which is February the 17th, uh, you will be <clears throat> making your first group project presentation and EIC on general dynamics, GD US equity. So from that perspective, uh, just as a setup for that presentation, remember that your PowerPoint presentation is due, it's a group project by 10 a.m. all sections. Somebody on your team must submit that PowerPoint presentation that you're gonna be presenting later in the day. Embedded in that power pres PowerPoint presentation must be all data associated with the presentation, including screenshots. Uh, basically part of the ground rules are that if the data is not in the presentation, even if you're talking about it, you won't get credit for it. So the data must be in the presentation. In addition, you have 10 minutes to present that data. So if you run out of time, even if it's in your PowerPoint, but you don't talk about it, you also won't get credit for it. So make sure your teams spend time preparing and practicing for that 10 minute presentation uh, because 10 minutes goes by very fast and you have to cover all of the content for the EIC. Uh, we will have six teams. Uh, all of you will be presenting. We will take volunteers at the beginning of the class, but uh, basically we'll get through all the teams during the class. Uh, I'll be keeping track of time for 10 minutes per team. Uh, in addition, uh, I will be asking one question to each team based on what's either in your PowerPoint and or contemporary news about general dynamics. And the answer to that question will be for a grade. So as a team presentation, you can decide who is presenting on behalf of your group. The entire team does not need to present, although who is presenting, that will represent the grade for the entire group, though it is the responsibility of all team members to help prepare the presentation, even if you are not presenting. Okay? So that's the EIC that's coming up on Wednesday. Any questions about that? Can we upload a Google Slides instead of like an actual PowerPoint? Uh, as long as it's not just a link and it's the actual Google Slide doc, that should be fine. But I need to be able to download it and view it while you're presenting it. Okay. Sure. Professor. Yeah, go ahead. Is it okay if, I know we have 10 minutes exactly, but is it okay if it's like under 10 or like Within I mean, there's no, there's no requirement that you have to talk for over 10 minutes. Like if you're done in nine minutes, you're, you're fine. But unfortunately, if you go past 10, I'm going to stop you. Gotcha. But there's no requirement. You have to use all the 10. As long as we talk about everything that's... As long as you have 10 to cover all the content, if you can do it more efficiently, um, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. But the danger is, you know, what you really have to be careful of is EIC can take a while and particularly the I. Uh, and so you don't want to spend so much time on the I, you don't get to the C, or particularly the future five forces, which I've seen happen to teams. So that's why I said you got to, you know, time your presentation accordingly. But if you okay. finish earlier, I'm not going to hold that against you. Okay, thank you. Sure. If we have two presenters, uh, should only one of us respond to your question at the end? Uh, that's up to you. I mean, technically, even if you're not presenting and somebody knows the answer, that's perfectly fine for answering the question. But again, I'll, I'll let you as a team choose how you want to handle the format. Because again, my, my goal here is not to ask you gotcha questions. I mean, it, it should be fairly obvious based on what you're presenting, the types of questions that I'll be asking. All right, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> All right. So the other uh, big item coming up is one week from today, February 22nd. Remember, Bloomberg is going to be here Again, their higher education team will be giving us advanced user training on the terminal, which you're now all certified for, as well as treating this as a recruiting event. Uh, so take advantage of that opportunity in class next Monday. Okay. Um, and then finally, the other thing I, I wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, briefly mention, share my screen here, is we go to Bloomberg, just kind of check in on the trading challenge see where we are today. So again, it's either idea or T message. T 
TMSG. Uh, this is section 401. So these are the teams over here on the left. Uh, if I click on portfolio value, that's the ranking of how you're being scored from highest to lowest. And essentially, first of all, you have to all have under 300,000, which is good. The only person that has more than that is me and I would be disqualified. I don't count anyways. Uh, and then the other thing is you need to have at least 10 longs. Everybody has met that threshold so far for this section, which is great for the first half. And we can see one team has jumped out to a very big lead. Uh, this team in first place with a 13% return uh, in the first two weeks of the trading challenge, which is very good. Um, and then you can see the relative rankings thereafter. So again, this, if grading were done today, it's obviously gonna be based on where you end up in a few weeks, in about a month. But uh, the way it would work is half of the grade is 10 points. And so first place gets five points. So right now this team would get five, the next two teams would get four, then three, then two, then one point. That would be the grade distribution if we were to close it out today. But again, portfolio value is how you're being ranked. Any questions about the trading challenge? All right, let's talk about the uh, EIC of Stanley Black & Decker. So as you do these companies, go to SWK US Equity, uh, before I even get into the EIC, one suggestion that I would make is to read the security description, which is the DES for a company. Uh, because if nothing else, it kind of gives the cliff notes of what's going on with the company, but most importantly, it gives this kind of description because if you don't know what the company does, then this is a good place to start. And one of the things that you'd read about Stanley Black & Decker is they kind of have three segments, right? They have their tool business, they have their industrial segment, and they have their security segment. Tool business is about 70% of sales. The other two segments about 30% of sales. And it kind of describes a little bit about each of the businesses. The other area that you might want to think about for a company is FA. And this is the historical financials and then go to segments. So again, just to see how in the 10K, the segments are being broken out. These again are the three segments of the business and you can see the actual revenue and kind of the percentage breakdown. Okay? So one of the things that we're gonna be looking at is when we did say, for example, United Airlines, well, they were kind of one business and it was kind of easy to talk about as a one size fits all for both the uh, industry and the company. Here, when you get into Stanley Black & Decker, that may not be the case because they're in multiple segments and those segments may have different five forces, for example, and different industry spreads. So we need to be aware of that as we're getting ready to do our analysis. And so as a hint, same thing's probably gonna come up when you get into general dynamics. So for example, if you were to look at general dynamic segments, GD US equity, you'll notice that they have a lot of different segments, okay? So they got a technology business, which is $12.7 billion. They got a marine system business, which is 10 billion, aerospace, 8 billion, combat system, 7 billion, okay? So this business operates more like a conglomerate than a kind of a single business company. It's just something you need to be aware of. And again, if you go to DES uh, and click here on the more, you get a general description of what these businesses do. Okay. Now, most of the businesses you can see is North America, but nonetheless kind of walks through their various businesses and what they do. So kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor about the company before we get into the EIC. So we know what we are evaluating. You need to talk about the numbers, but the numbers have to be put in context. Okay. So let's do, let's go back to homework three, which is on Stanley Black and Decker. And let's start out with the E. Now over the last couple of weeks, I don't think anything we've talked about in the economy is changing. So I'm not really gonna spend as much time on that because we've been talking about the E part of the EIC, 
although you'll need to do that as part of your presentations. But I want to focus on screenshots. So if I go to RV, first thing I want to look at is the markets beta, markets, and then beta. Now, when I think about the segments of the company, the comp group, you see that Bloomberg is using an algorithm to create what it says are the best fit competitors. And this is for the whole firm, but if I click on this drop down, I notice that Bloomberg is kind of breaking it out into a couple of different sub segments. Well, one of the seg sub segments is machinery and equipment slash the tool business, right? The other segment, the 30% of the company is the industrial and the security business. And the first thing you notice is that the peer groups are slightly different. And more importantly, the raw betas are different, okay? So if I'm talking about commercial and residential building competitors, so the, again, the industrial security segments, that industry beta is 1.27, right? Whereas if I talk about the tool business, that industry beta is 1.44. So Stanley Black & Decker is 1.58. So if the problem is for a company, we don't really break out the beta by industry, but it's in a couple of different industries. And so a couple of observations. So the first thing is both of the industries that, that it's in, as defined by these peer groups, are having a beta well above one, either 1.44 or 1.27. And, and so both are very economically sensitive. And Stanley Black & Decker at 1.58 is even more sensitive in both of those segments. But the point is, we're gonna care a lot about the economy when we evaluate Stanley Black & Decker and its peers, more so in the tool business than in sort of the security industrial business. But nonetheless, both businesses will be very sensitive up and down and be more cyclical when it comes to the economy. So that's the first thing to know about Stanley Black & Decker. So before we get to the I, what do you think makes them have a higher beta as an industry <clears throat> than one? What do you think leads to the cyclical nature of this business in terms of economic information? Well, considering they're uh, selling commercial tools, <clears throat> I mean, I think that would heavily rely on like GDP as well as like the overall health of the economy. Yeah, so their, their customers are gonna be, you know, either people that buy tools, so builders, home builders, commercial, residential, and same thing, people are buying the, uh, the equipment for those to make those that they provide. And they also are selling sort of specialty tools to manufacturers. Uh, we can actually tie this back to ECSU and say that two of the buckets of ECSU are housing and industrial. And these are where a lot of their clients lie, which are very cyclical business that are driving the business cycles. So that's one of the things that we need to know about both these segments. And obviously, by, based on the difference of beta, the tool business with a slightly higher industry beta probably right now is a little bit more sensitive to the changes in the economic cycles, though you can say that the, the, cons the industrial slash security business, which is probably in that other 30%, is still sensitive as well, but not nearly as sensitive as tools. But that's probably one of the other things you're seeing that we need to know about this business as we get started, is that this business is going to be a cyclical business, much more cyclical and very much tied to the ebbs and flows of the economy. Whether we look at it as a global economy or whether we look at it as a US economy. All right, those are some things we should be talking about for the E for Stanley Black & Decker. Next, we're gonna move on to the I, okay. So back to RV, as we define the industry, custom spread, And if I look at the two kind of segments I was just looking at for the E, I'll start out with machinery. So kind of the tool business. And I see that this industry has a spread of negative 
10 basis points. So basically as an ROIC of 10%, a whack of around 10%, and this industry is not really creating value. It's a break-even industry, okay? So that's the first thing I'm gonna to need to explain in the five forces. Why am I seeing a, a tiny bit negative, but basically a break-even spring, right? Whereas when I switch this to commercial residential buildings, notice that this industry's ROIC is defined by this peer group has a 21% ROIC against a 9% WAC, which is giving a spread of 12.65 points, right? So this is your first big clue, if you didn't already have it in the E part of this exercise, that the industries are sort of different dynamics, different five forces that we need to talk about because for the 30% of their business, which their peers seem to have a 21% ROIC versus the 70% of their business, which their peers seem to have a 10% ROIC, there's fundamental differences in those businesses. <clears throat> and so therefore, we're gonna have to do at least two five forces analysis as part of our Stanley Black and Decker exercise. Okay? And this would be why. Now, let's go back and let's talk first about this business. So if we go to this industry. So think of it as some local US tool companies, <clears throat> tool manufacturer machine companies. What about the five forces explains an industry that has a slightly negative spread, 10 basis points? What makes this industry a little bit more challenging? Is it firepower, supplier power? Like what, what do the forces explain this spread? I'd say it's supplier power. Um, I did a little bit of research on uh, the types of suppliers for this industry and they're heavily influenced by commodity prices like some steel and zinc and iron. And even even though their, their direct suppliers are um, like making making the parts already before they sell them to Stanley Black and Decker, like they're influenced by those commodity prices. And a lot of them have seen in, like inflated prices throughout COVID. Uh, so they probably, it's probably hurting their margins. That was something that I thought about. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's an important thing to understand is that like many of the other industries, commodity prices are important, but for this industry might be more important. And they don't have a lot of control over that, even though it's a commodity. And nonetheless, that is having an influence on the ability for this industry to make money. Why else does this industry have close to a zero spread? What can we say about the other forces? I spoke about uh, buyer power and that um, if you look at um, their buyers, it's primarily Lowe's <clears throat> and Home Depot. And I also went on Stanley Black & Decker's website and they don't sell their own products from their own website. They go strictly through their buyers. So that was also um, gives buyers a lot of um, power because they don't sell it directly to the customer. Okay, so two things. One, the, the customers of Stanley Black & Decker and a lot of their peers are kind of concentrated uh, particularly if you think about the, the residential <clears throat> and small business builders, <clears throat> excuse me, that are uh, going through Lowe's and Home Depot, they're the ones with the power and, and they're exercising it because, and you can actually look at this list to kind of get a sense of this. There's not like a bunch of big players on the rivalry side of this industry. It's a lot of small players. And Home Depot and Lowe's are big players. So you're, you're all funneling through a couple of gatekeepers to get to your customer. And the gatekeepers, in this case, the Home Depots and the Lowe's have more of the power. And this industry is very rivalry, a lot of rivalry to get to those gatekeepers because they're not selling B to C, they're selling through the Home Depot and Lowe's. And that is affecting the power balance of the industry in a negative way hurting the spread of the industry, right? So we got two parts there. Number one, 
the buyers have power over this industry for the reasons we just said. And that number two leads to more rivalry because basically this industry has a lot of competitors. It's not a few big competitors. It's a lot of small competitors competing to be on the Home Depot low shelves. And a lot of the products and the tools are not that highly differentiated, meaning a hammer is a hammer, screwdriver is a screwdriver, and a drill is a drill. And yeah, there's some, some drills that have a few more features, but the technology is not all that advanced that it can't be done anywhere else in the world. And so I would say that you're not seeing tremendous barriers to entry from people coming in and getting into this business. And that further probably exacerbates the rivalry because the other part is switching costs. Meaning if, you know, Snap-on makes a better tool than Stanley Black & Decker, I could easily switch to that. And I'm, I'm informed about it and they kind of do the same thing. So unless we're talking about some of their segments, which are making very specialty tools for manufacturing, a lot of their businesses are, are in very competitive markets, which drives a lot of rivalry. <clears throat> and that is probably another reason why you don't see a very high spread in this industry, close to a zero spread. Right. So we got pretty strong buyers. We got a lot of rivalry. The barriers to, the, to entry in this business are, are not nearly as high as like we talked about in the airline business. Substitutes, <clears throat> generally, you know, we didn't talk too much about that, but they, they don't seem to be helping this industry and suppliers are commodity businesses. And right now they seem to be having some of the power for being, you know, high priced. You're just kind of taking that. There's not much you can do about that. So that's why this industry has close to a zero spread today. Uh, professor? Yes. Sorry, qu uh, quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, when you're running through these, um, I was just a little confused. Uh, when you when you go to the region, um, I actually emailed the TA about this, and he told me to do, to do it globally. But I'm not. I was just a little confused as to how we're supposed to know whether to do global or local. It's a great question. Um, I did not give guidance for this exercise because as we start to transition, you need to tell me, like as we look at this business, should we be looking at this on a global basis or should we be looking at it on like a country basis? And there, you can make arguments for both at Stanley Black & Decker, but here's the point. Even if you've looked at this on a global basis, you're now seeing a slightly negative spread, 8.29 against 10.91. And you'd still have to talk about the five forces in context of the global forces for this industry if you define sort of manufacturing tools globally. So you could have used this screenshot. And as long as you had explained that negative spread of 2.55 with the same five forces, and I don't think you're gonna come up with too many different forces that are doing that, then that would be acceptable. Thank you. Sure. Professor? Yep. In terms of the beta and the spread analysis piece, were you looking for the, the whole firm or two screenshots for each for each of the two industries listed under that? I, I think what the big explanation you're seeing is the reason why I'm jumping back and forth between these two screenshots is you need to be talking about the two industries because the tool business is has a different dynamic, whether you did local or global, than the industrial and the security business. So at a minimum, I mean, if, if you wanted to, to mix the two businesses and talk about it, I guess you could, but what's more important is there's a different dynamic for the 30% of their business than there is, which you can clearly see on this next screen, even if I did it globally, <clears throat> as a positive spread business or locally, this is still a positive spread business, but that's the point, is that if I think about the industrial and security part of the business, this business has a very high spread. It's got a 21% ROIC, it has a 9% WAC, and a 12.65% spread. Whereas if I look at the kind of core tool machinery business, that business has a break even spread with a 10% ROIC. So there's a fundamental difference in those two industries. So that's what I need to explain, okay? 
So that's that's why I would say you need really two different screenshots here to represent that. And if you try to mix it together with the whole firm, you're getting a weighted average of everything, but that's not really what we'd be looking at for understanding the markets of Stanley Black and Becker. Yeah, Professor, that makes sense. Um, when I was doing the homework, uh, I was trying to follow the instructions to a T that we were doing, uh, you know, in class. Like I didn't want to get points off for looking at the separate businesses, so I didn't know that it would end up. Well, I, gave, us. I gave a slight hint last week, but but that's the point. Like when we did United Airlines, there you don't really have this issue. Like there's there's not really a you know an airline business and then some other completely different business in that United Airlines that makes it different. Here, and that's why I kind of mentioned briefly last week, uh, and I did say it's more of a, a hint than an explanation, but the, the idea is we've got to these other companies, they're more difficult. And that's why I suggested just even going forward, you know, look at the segments of the companies, you know, look at the description of the companies, start even seeing how Bloomberg starts to define the companies. And what you'll start to see is, different peer groups are suggestive that different parts of their business are facing different industries. And I am telling you that for general dynamics, it gets even more complex, all right, which is the company you're gonna be doing on Wednesday. So if you're doing the, the whole firm of general dynamics, well, it's not gonna make more make sense. I mean, most of their businesses in the US, you'll see that in the description, but shipbuilding and, and building nuclear powered submarines is probably a different business than building their jets, right? Which is different business than their technology business. So you might end up with three segments for general dynamics. And, but here's the, the idea is that, you know, if you get two segments of a business and they're earning about the same rate of return and nothing's really too different about the five forces, that's one thing. But here with Stanley Black & Decker, we got two segments of this business and, and the economics of each look radically different. And so, that's the point we want to start to understand. What's radically different about this? What makes this part of the, the peer group, this industry, much more attractive? Why does this one have a positive spread where well, the other one was break-even spread? So let's, uh, let's talk about it in the context of five forces. What do you think is different here in the context of the five forces? For this group that's on my screen. And even if you didn't, <clears throat> by the way, uh, even if you didn't um, answer it this way in the paper, you can still participate in our class discussion here. But what would be different? Um, I would guess, again, the direction said use a whole company. So I didn't actually do a big deep dive into like the security industry, but I could assume that the security industry is probably less uh, capital intensive because the manufacturing process, like there's less things that need to be physically made versus like the hand tools industry. So that could be why like the spread in the security industry is better versus like the standard hand tools industry. Okay, that's part of it. It absolutely could be part of it. But just look at this list. Look at this list and look at this list. Just prima facie on the face of it, what what starts to look different between this scrollable list? There, there's this, multiple, oh, sorry. Go ahead. There are multiple um, competitors in the previous list compared to uh, the screen that is being shown currently. So that means that the power of like competition and rivalry uh, is different between the two. I, I think you're onto something. Is that this industry, and, and you can kind of look at market cap as a proxy for size. We probably will break out revenue separately. But the point is here, you got a few big players. And these are big dominant players in this industry. It, it, it's almost like an oligopoly. Whereas here, in the other segment, you don't really have that. 
Like there's not really a big, big players in the issue. You got a lot of midsize and small players. And, and so just the rivalry in that business is different. And so with less rivalry in this business over here, it, these players that are bigger actually are making a whole lot more money. And that is also suggestive that there probably is more differentiation in this part of the segment which means maybe there are more barriers to entry in this business, the security and the construct or the industrial business than the tool business. Because anybody can build a hammer, anybody can build a saw, anybody can build a drill, but maybe it's not so easy to build elevators. Maybe it's not so easy to, to build air conditioning, heating equipment systems. That gets a little bit more complicated. And then the other piece of the business is when we start thinking about distribution. Somebody mentioned earlier in this class that, hey, in the tool business, you're going through Home Depot and Lowe's. Here, they don't go through Home Depot and Lowe's, right? There, there's not a Home Depot and Lowe's for residential commercial construction. <clears throat> so as a result of that, they're selling to the construction firms themselves. There's a lot of them. So therefore, the buyers in this business don't have the same concentrated power that they do against the tool part of the business. And that actually helps this business become more profitable. And the substitutes are probably also less substitutable, meaning if, if you're gonna put an elevator into a commercial building, it's probably less, less options if you got multiple floors about moving people up and down. So therefore the substitutes aren't as viable. And so that's the point. You gotta go to the players in this list if you're building a building and you're doing certain things, <clears throat> or if you need, like I said, big commercial heating and air conditioning equipment, on a global scale, there's a few players. That's Linux, that's Carrier. <clears throat> and those are more attractive, bigger businesses. So again, as we, we do a deep dive, we're kind of reaching our research. We at least start to notice some things that are different about these two, which probably lead to why the five forces are different. And I, I think they're both probably the same when it comes to supplier power, but what really is different about this segment of the business is it does appear that there's less rivalry. It does appear that the buyers don't have as much power. And it does appear that there is some form of barrier to entry to becoming bigger, or at least an economy of scale that these firms are achieving. And that is what's probably explaining the positive spread here that we don't see in the other half of the business. Questions about any of that? All right, which would then lead to, would any of this change in five years in either one of these segments? <clears throat> so I'll start with the first segment, the industry that has the slightly negative spread. Is anything gonna really change about this in five years? My perspective is probably not, All right? Meaning you're still gonna go through Home Depot and Lowe's primarily for a lot of your, your products. You're still gonna see a lot of buyer power you're still going to see a very competitive marketplace. And essentially, this business is going to compete a lot more on price than anything else, and getting cost out of the business. Now, here's the opportunity, which is there could be consolidation, meaning this is an industry where you could actually see somebody come in doing a roll up or buying a couple of companies to try and eliminate some of the competition and become bigger. But unless we see that, this is an industry that's probably going to have somewhere probably close to a break even spread unless we see some changes in the dynamics and there's not a lot of catalyst for changing those dynamics over the next five years. So I still think this segment's probably more break even spread in five years, right? Versus the other segment of the business is the 30% of Stanley Black & Decker. Well, this is a, a different story. This business has a very positive spread. And so is that anything going to change here in five years? There'll probably be more rivalry. Because if you actually kind of read through what Stanley Black & Decker is trying to do through the, the company filings and talk about the analysts they're telling them to do, <clears throat> what they're saying is, look, for our tool business, we're cutting costs. And for other businesses, we want to grow them. And, and again, at a very high level, it makes complete sense. Because why wouldn't I want to go to after a business that has 21% ROIC? Why wouldn't I want it to get into some of these other segments? And so that's the point. As people go after these businesses, I think that it will increase the rivalry a little bit and it will put a little bit of pressure on the spread. 
Now, I don't think it's going to upend the spread and make it look like the tool business, but I do think the spread will come down slightly because these are established players. You're not going to wipe them out, but at the same time, add some competition. So take a little bit of their, their market share away, and that would lead to potentially a slightly lower spread in this segment, though still pretty positive in the next five years. That would be my view of where this might end up, right? Now, the final part of this would be your C, which is does Stanley Black & Decker demonstrate competitive advantage? In both, sec both cases, the answer would be no. Their ROIC of 10% against a whack of 11, that negative one point spread in either business segment does not demonstrate competitive advantage. They don't demonstrate competitive advantage in this peer group, and they don't demonstrate competitive advantage in the tool business as well, All right? So, you know, what are they trying to do? So I think about in five years, well, they're talking about cost consolidation. They want to take costs out of their business, right? Makes sense given this business, but I think everyone's trying to take costs out of this business. So in five years, are they going to look that much different than their peers? I, I don't see that much differentiation amongst these peers to begin with. So my sense is no, I don't think they're going to be that much different on the tool side than their peers. Maybe they'll improve a little bit, but they're already behind their, their peers. The opportunity is really here if they can grow the 30% pie and do better in this business. So here's the point. Will they have competitive advantage in this business in five years? Probably not as well, because if you look at the returns that you're getting at an Otis, that you're getting at, at um, a Lennox and others, they're actually pretty high to begin with. So will Stanley Black & Decker get a spread above that in five years? Maybe not. Will it get a spread towards that in five years? Maybe so. And so that's the idea is I think they will actually improve their spread and they'll improve their spread by getting more sales in an attractive business. But I do think that they will still be relatively less performing than some of their peers in this very attractive industry. And I don't think they're gonna actually achieve competitive advantage in this segment compared to their peers in five years. It's a longer road than that. Now, if you look at what the analysts are saying, the analysts are relatively bullish on Stanley Black & Decker and the buy sell hold opinions under a and I mean, they're rating a 4.22 out of five with 12 buys, five holds and one sell. But again, that's the context of the buy sell hold, which is, you know, the analysts assume that they're gonna do better, but part of the reason they're better is because they're going into a more attractive business. And, and if they can do better in the more attractive business, that should help the overall firm. But that's kind of how I would think of the EIC for Stanley Black & Decker. Questions? All right, again, that was a lot to cover. You only have 10 minutes for Wednesday for general dynamics, same ideas. You know, in terms of the peer groups, I'll be really clear about this. At some point, I'm not gonna just spoon feed you all of this. You have to use your own sort of thinking in this class to figure out <clears throat> what is appropriate. <clears throat> you know, you guys are smart kids. You should be able to start to understand by some of the data you see that as we apply this, that everything is not just going to be a square peg in a square hole. That sometimes you are going to see some things that are different. And that's the point. We need to explain some of the differences. So I'm giving you a hint that general dynamics is going to be a more complex firm. And we need to understand that when we start to explain their industry, we understand their competitive advantage and whether we explain things are gonna change over time. So my sense is some of you started to do that, some of you may not have done that, but that's what you need to do for Wednesday. So what I'm gonna do is give you some time today for the rest of the class to work in your teams so that you can further prepare for Wednesday. Okay? So we're gonna be done with the, the lecture and we're gonna end the discussion a little bit early so I'm gonna turn over the balance of time to you to work on your teams so that you're ready for your presentations. If anybody wants to stick around and ask questions, I'll be here, but otherwise we'll let everybody else go and we'll see everybody on Wednesday. So class over, have a good day. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I had a quick question after class, if that's okay. Yeah, I figured a couple of people did. I think Yash had one too.
send me an email about it. So yep. I'm going to stop the uh, share and stop the recording.